I thought I'm not afraid to die, but when I almost died, man, I was afraid. I begged for my life, I cried. <laughs> The loss has created such grief that it's almost perpetual. A family no more than gets over one loss and we have another. It has that numbing effect. You, you just take it as everyday living now. And it's, it's just natural for us to go to a funeral. You know, it's just like you lose half of yourself, your other half, and you lose your soulmate. You know, you just... You're so lost. It affects just more than the victim. It affects the person who may be the perpetrator, all the families on both sides. And so it's, it's very devastating to our people. We're interconnected so many ways that when, when we lose someone, it, it doesn't just affect that family, it affects our whole community. My little granddaughter, drew a green car, her mother was killed in their green car, and she put everybody in it and said that they were all still there. It took so much away from us. It took our self, our self pride and our self esteem away from us. We're not numb to the grief, but I think we're numb to the cause of the grief. Patricia Wagner, but most people call me, know me by Annie. I've lived here most of my life and I've always loved it here. I mean, we have the best water, the fresh air, we have a lot of wind, but you know, that doesn't bother me. We had a real hard life, me and my brothers and sisters. Uh, my parents were alcoholics, so we kind of grew up real hard and learned at a young age, you know, just to kind of take care of ourselves. I mean, it, back then it was like normal for kids to sit out, out in front of a bar, you know, till two, three in the morning. You know, I never wanted to raise my kids around that. I was real young when I met Dale, and oh my God, he was so handsome, I thought. You know, he was a really nice looking Blackfeet man. He was really close to his kids, and all of his kids just really loved him a lot. You know, he was a family man. Dale died in 07. He was catching a ride with uh, his friend, I guess, um, the car must have rolled on Dale. I really don't know the whole story, but yeah, my son Luke had to do CPR on his father. I think to this day it still affects him. I was grieving so hard. I just kind of shut myself down. I just, you know, I, I just wanted to get by him, touch him and talk to him. and. It was real hard. It took me about a year to start, you know, kind of come out of it a little bit. You know, it's just like you lose half of yourself, your other half, when you lose your soulmate. You know, you just, you're so lost. You know, it's just, you lose yourself in grief. They just didn't know how to deal with it at all. They. They couldn't deal with his death. Um, like I'd look up on this hill where he died and I'd see one of them standing up there for a long time. You know, um, after he died, they'd stand up there, you know, like 
for hours and you know and then I'd find myself sitting up there for hours. <laughs> I even used to sleep up there in the summertime. <laughs> and uh, uh, all of us, you know, it affected our whole family, you know, and we see that on this reservation, just the grief, because we have so many deaths. I think alcohol is one of the ways that the Blackfeet have learned to cope with the grief and the loss. Oh, I've seen so many car wrecks, I mean, a lot of um, drunk driving related accidents. Some of them would be my friends or people I knew. And that was real hard. I think a lot of people are more aware now, you know, and that they do call for a friend to drive them. Because for number one, they don't want to get those DUIs. You know, so I think they're doing that more, but not enough, you know. I worry all the time that these, you know, that my kids or um, my grandkids could get into a wreck by some, by a junk driver killing them or hitting them. I'll walk along this highway and pray. I always walk along it and pray and pray for everybody that's driving. I pray for our community and I pray for the people that are drinking that they use common sense, that they get a sober driver and that they use their seat belts and you know just say my prayers for everybody. I just hold dear into my heart that you know, we had four beautiful children and, you know, I feel sad sometimes because he didn't get to meet most of our grandchildren. You know, who knows, you know, maybe he does know them. We don't know that, you know, but uh, I just hope he's at peace, you know. I just want him to be at peace and to be happy, you know, and I want my kids to be at peace. Well, I think they know that they were loved, you know, I know they all know that, that he loved them dearly. So, we'll never forget him, you know. I am Charles Archambault. Had a pretty good childhood, you know, my mom, my mom did her best being a being a single parent. I really have to pride my mother now. Looking back, raising me by herself, she pretty much dedicated you know, her life to doing that. And she didn't use drugs, she didn't drink alcohol. You know, even I had that up, good upbringing with, with, with my family and my grandmother. I, I was, uh, I don't know what you would call it, a, just a bad, rotten, spoiled kid. <laughs> you know, I was a grandma's boy. I, I, didn't always listen to my mom. You know, and at a young age, I started hanging out with older kids and, and got into drugs and alcohol at a young age, you know, pretty young. And no matter how hard my mom tried to keep me away from all that, you know, I still, I just, I just wouldn't listen to my mom or my grandma. Well, despite me being a rotten bad kid and always getting in trouble in school, getting in fights, getting in, you know, all this ridiculous trouble at school, um, I normally did pretty well in school, I actually, tried hard at school. My mom taught me to read and write at a really young age and uh, arithmetic, you know, and it, it took me a long ways. I did really well in football. Coach asked me if I'd ever thought about going to college. You know, I said, no, I, you know, I haven't even think, thought about college. And he said, well, you know, Charles, you're, you're, uh, you're good enough, your grades are good enough, you could probably play some college football. Uh, I was in contact with the a few frontier colleges, MSC Northern being one, and then the one that really pursued that I was interested in was, uh, it's called Haskell, it's in Kansas. It's all Indian college, actually, junior college. And I agreed to go there, and I talked to the head coach, you know, I told him that I was gonna come. As soon as I graduated, I couldn't wait to um, leave my mom's house, you know. Like, so I think the day after graduation, I packed up my vehicle and I told her I was moving back to my grandma's house. So I come back to Browning, you know, hang, get hooked up right back up with the same old buddies and doing the same old, same old. And it's come fall time to go to college, and uh, I, I didn't go. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't leave. I didn't go play football. I remember going to a football game, and I, I drank so much. I was in a blackout. I don't remember nothing. Some deer came on the road just north of Big Fork. 
I swerved, overcorrected, went in a ditch, and hit an approach, and I was probably, you know, driving over 100 miles an hour. I was partying, I was drinking, I was driving, and driving fast, man, no seat belts, my favorite things to do, you know, <laughs> stupid things now that I look back. You know, I always had this mentality growing up that I couldn't be hurt, you know, I was all oh, my, you know, I'm indestructible, I can't be hurt, I can always walk away from everything. I'd been in car wrecks before this car wreck, bad car wrecks, uh, with me driving, me drinking and driving, and you know, despite losing family, friends, uh, you know, I always thought, it, can't, it won't happen to me, not me, it'll never happen to me. In the ICU, you know, I got a ventilator on, man. I got tubes hanging out everywhere. And despite all that, I start trying to get up. I got a feeding tube on, I rip the feeding tube on, I take the ventilator. I'm trying to get up, and it still don't dawn on me that, I, that you know, my legs ain't working. I push my legs off the side of the bed, and I'm trying to get up. Man, it was, it was devastating, you know? I, I mean, it was horrible. It, Everything I'd ever did, I'd use my legs, you know, I, everything. You know, whether it was growing up, you know, riding horses, swimming, fishing, hunting, playing sports. Everything I did, I used my legs. I just cried and cried and cried and cried. I'd lost all, a lot of friends, a lot of family to, to drinking, driving. Um, and and I almost died too. I knew I almost died, man. I, I, you know, I always thought I wasn't afraid of death, wasn't afraid to die. But when I almost died, man, I was afraid. I begged for my life. I cried. So I knew that me being alive, me being able to come back, you know, um, whether I was paralyzed or not, I felt that, you know, I was given another chance. I was like, I'm, I was given another chance. Why me? You know, why the hell me? I was feeling pretty bad for myself and and my mom, you know, she just she just let me know that, you know, this is <clears throat> the reason you are where you you know you're you're in a wheelchair is because of the choices you made. And it's hard for me to think now, you know, with my mom with me being a parent, how hard it would be for her. You know, tell your own kid that. Uh, my daughter now, and I couldn't imagine her, you know, getting in a car wreck and being paralyzed. And on top of all that, and then having to tell her, well, you did this to yourself, you know. This, that's love, man. That's, that's, you know, that's, that's my mom. And actually, in that summer, I met I met my girlfriend Jalen, and she she uh, ended up coming back with me that little later on that fall. I didn't think I could actually have kids. I didn't think it was possible after my car accident, and Jalen ended up getting pregnant. I don't know. It's just an unexplainable feeling for me, and you know, right away I. I I'd, I'd pray, you know, I'm not, I'm not much of a religious man, but I would pray and I would pray that my baby would be healthy. And, and, and we had a healthy baby, we had a perfect healthy baby. I'm an instructor here at the community college now and I enjoy it, I love my job, you know, I get the summers off, I get to build this relationship with, with uh, people in the community, with my students, and ultimately I get to share what I've learned. You know, Sometimes I look back and I'm like, man, I grew up counting books of food stamps, you know, not, not reading the uh, Wall Street Journal to see how my stocks are doing, and now I have that knowledge. I always wanted to get my education and come back and give back to my community, you know. And I never knew how. I never knew how I was gonna come back here and give back to the community. But I knew that I wanted to. That was my goal overall. I love my life, you know. I mean, life. I couldn't ask for any more. Um, I have I have a girlfriend. She loves me. Um, she loves me dearly. I love her. 
We have a six-year-old daughter. She's healthy. She's perfect. She's gorgeous. I have a job. I have a home. I have a car. Now that I have a family, you know, like I say, it's it's my ultimate goal is just to be a good dad. You know, everything else, I don't really, I really don't stress too much about. I try to get out there and do my part and talk to them about, just share a little bit about my life story. Um, and ultimately I get at saying, hey man, you know, buckle up, wear a seatbelt. Don't drink and drive. I mean, Cause if you do, you're gonna end up like me or worse, you're gonna not be here. You know, you're gonna be like a lot of our friends and family. You're gonna be dead. Being in the car accident, you know, suffering a spinal cord injury, becoming a paraplegic actually saved my life, believe it or not saved my life. For me to be in that, that mind state at one time and to almost lose my life, you know, the car accident caused me to really look at life and um, I was given a second chance, you know, too many of my friends and family didn't get a second chance. I was given a second chance and I told myself that, you know, with the encouragement from my mom that I was going to do something better and then once my family came along, I was just you know, I made sure that I was going to turn my life around. I was going to do, uh, have a better upbringing for my daughter. Yeah! Alcoholism and impaired driving is probably the biggest killer on this reservation. It was ingrained in us from when we were very young to have a good time was to get drunk. But here among our people, it is catastrophic. There's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of extreme poverty, and you know, there's this generation after generation after generation after generation that have been drinking, you know, using drugs. You know, everyone wants to party, everyone wants to go out and have fun, but they don't realize the dangers of what happens. And it's so easy for our youth to get a hold of drugs and alcohol. It's really a big problem here. I, it's really a big problem. And it's something that we need to get down to the source and we need to fix the problem. And don't give your kids a set of keys and that's if they're drinking. You know, if somebody's drunk at your kitchen table and they can't walk, well, you know they can't drive, but yet you're letting that person get up, walk out to their vehicle and leave your home. I think we can overcome the challenges of impaired driving by more prevention activities, starting in the school and throughout this community by helping in our treatment centers to help people overcome their addictions. Youth is everything, you know, our youth has to kind of step it up a little bit more. And I really feel that our community needs to focus on the youth a lot more. Our youth are the ones that are being left behind. Somebody's got to say something, it's got to start somewhere. And people got to want to, want to change. They got to want to do it personally. It's just like a big circle. If you don't break the cycle of this abuse, then it'll keep going to the next generation and it'll keep going like a whirlwind just around until somebody in that circle will stop and break that, that cycle. The Blackfeet tribe is a big family. We all care about each other in one way or another. It feels good to know your identity, to know where you're from and who you belong to, and to know that um, we come from a proud tradition of people, a proud people. What makes me proud of being Blackfeet is the history that we have. Yeah, I'm proud to be a Blackfeet. To me, this is God's country, you know, and our land is, man, we have the most beautiful land I've ever seen. I'm very proud to know that I come from very strong people. I'm proud of my culture, that it's still alive and thriving today, that we still identify ourselves as Blackfeet. I've always been, even since I was young, just being proud that I'm Blackfeet. We come from good, strong people, and that we should just carry that on.